Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. This is the daily chart of silver provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. And you can see that uh, I've drawn in the primary trend lines, the, of course the major uptrend line from the bottom of 2008. And uh, this is a very valid line. The touch points aren't perfect, uh, but uh, they're very close. And uh, then the other two downtrend lines, the first one is the one I pointed out that excludes the 3750 rally, and the other one is the one that takes that into consideration. Now, the top one is predicting that $30 target, and that $30 target is very key. As I said before, the 2850 target was a very key target to get through, and you can see the, uh, the price rise has accelerated as we pass through that 2850 point. Uh, I expect something similar when we pass through the 30 point. As I said last night, it's quite possible we could actually move to 32 in a very short order if we get through these lines. So uh, that's very important if the tide has turned. Now we're going to see that when we look at the uh, change in opinion or the alleged change in opinion from uh, Bill Gross of PIMCO and uh, but before we do that let's go over to the uh, question of the night I want to pull in real quick before we do that and uh, you can see here that silver is actually kind of uh, bursting in after hours trade if we pull up the volume chart you can see we had a nice spike at about two o'clock that was uh, close to the release of the Fed minutes and uh, the Fed uh, hinted, just kind of hinted at the fact that there might be another QE. Of course, we know that it's already going on in a stealth manner, but just the hint of the possibility of something coming from the Fed caused uh, the prices of both gold and silver to rise dramatically. So before we go and look at uh, PIMCO, Let's take a look at uh, the question of the night, and this is from Da Vinci J15, and uh, you can see he signed up on the forum, and this is a, a man that I have great respect for. He's a pioneer in the uh, field of silver manipulation, also an uh, early adopter of bitcoins. Hopefully he was early enough. If he, if he was early enough, then of course he's already rich. But uh, a... a uh, free thinker, a clear thinker, and uh, someone who comes up with original ideas. Uh, I can't say enough about him, but this is his question. Uh, details of silver manipulation. Hi, Brother John. I know many people who do not believe that the silver market is manipulated. If you have the time, can you detail all the evidence of silver manipulation, assuming you were trying to convince someone like Peter Schiff? As you know, as you may know, Peter Schiff does not think silver is manipulated, and I speculate that he has that belief because his business depends on believing it. For example, if anyone were to consider the gold and silver manipulation, they would have to put places like the Perth Mint under a microscope because the manipulation goes far beyond just fixing the price. The ma manipulation also requires suckers to own gold and silver derivatives that are paper bets on silver and gold where your counterparty may or may not hedge those bets with physical gold and silver. Thanks for your hard work and all you've put into discussing silver with the public, Da Vinci. Uh, quote, if the silver market is not manipulated today, it's the only market that is not manipulated. Chris Powell. So, very good question. Now, back in the... Uh, crash of Bear Stearns around 2008. Uh, if you were around for that, it was a very strange time in the silver market. We actually saw a, uh, I, I believe it was a Sunday night. Uh, I can't recall for certain, but I think it was a weekend and we had the collapse of Bear Stearns. We had Jason Hommel sending out a, uh, a missive and then we had the drying up of physical silver and I mean it really dried up you couldn't get anything and then we had the collapse of the price of silver and uh, so 
and at that time uh, Jason Hommel had been sending out a number of letters and emails and things updates about the very large number of people who had allocated uh, allocated accounts unallocated accounts and uh, at the Perth Mint and uh, for those of you who haven't heard of those terms an allocated account is an account where the silver or gold or whatever metal you're holding is uh, is stored separately for you so that if you want to take delivery you just wire them and they send it off to you unallocated on the other hand is a pool of supposedly the physical metal and uh, it's not uh, allocated to a specific person but there's a large amount and uh, that is not as easy to get delivery on and uh, you have to move it to allocate etc so there was a big controversy at the time uh, because a large number of the allocated metal holders were actually requesting their metal and uh, there was a large amount of delays from Perth on getting that metal out now I think they pretty much got all that metal out that was requested but it took a long time and it was difficult and that's what caused Jason to speculate that there may be some problems with delivery now if you think about it uh, the terms allocated and unallocated uh, these are really just going to be terms that don't really mean anything if you uh, have any doubt as to the validity of the claims in other words you're totally taking the word of the person who's saying to you that, uh, that your metal is held in an allocated account versus an unallocated account do you really know where it's held I, I don't think you really do you really don't know until the rubber meets the road and that's when you send in your request to have the allocated metals delivered to you and of course if you start to meet delays at that point then you're going to have to wonder whether the metal is really allocated or not. Now we had something like that reported with Eric Sprott. As you know, Eric Sprott has taken delivery of uh, large amounts of physical silver and uh, I believe King World News reported and others that uh, some of the bars that were supposedly quote unquote allocated actually came uh, delivered with a uh, melt or, or a mint date that was later than uh, they uh, supposedly existed so it's a very complex issue and you need to understand that really uh, the determination or the ultimate reality of whether something is held unallocated or allocated or if it really even exists is just your trust in that party so again investment in paper gold and paper silver you're really just a creditor of that party and uh, you're taking their word at face value whether or not it is allocated unallocated uh, all these things are a matter of trust and that's going to help us segue into the main story of the night and that's going to involve PIMCO. Now, this story came out on the Dow Jones, and this is how PIMCO has added to their gold holdings on inflation concerns. Now, it's uh, very strange that PIMCO would just all of a sudden start having inflation concerns when we've had, uh, at least by the shadow stats uh, numbers, we've had uh, inflation raging. But anyway, let's let's read this and uh, examine it. Hopefully, we can uh, follow some of the rabbit trails and get more information here. The world's biggest bond fund manager, Pacific Investment Management Company, PIMCO, is buying gold futures as it bets that global inflation rates will pick up over the next three years. So it's clear there they're buying the futures. 
the PIMCO Commodity Real Return Strategy Fund, which has about $20 billion in assets, has increased its gold holdings to 11.5% of total assets recently from 10.5% two months ago and has been adding to the position when gold prices dipped towards $1,500 a troy ounce, says Nick Johnson, the fund's co-portfolio manager. The money manager predicts global inflation rates will run higher on average over the next three to five years than what the world had witnessed over the past 25 years. However, the risk won't arise for another 12 months during which inflation should be subdued. Inflation, the erosion in money's purchasing power that is typically measured by the increase in the price of goods and services over time, plays a key role in the debt markets where PIMCO, a unit of Alliance, SE has made its name. So we're going to come back to that. PIMCO has aired its concern concerns about inflation in the past and moved to avoid longer dated treasury bonds in favor of inflation protected securities. But the move toward gold is recent and reflects an escalation in the fund manager's concern. In the face of such risks, quote, broadly speaking, we prefer owning real assets as opposed to financial assets, Mr. Johnson told Dow Jones Newswires in a recent interview. So I'll link this. You can read the rest of this, but uh, that's very telling that uh, they're stating that they're interested in owning real assets as opposed to financial assets. So. Let's dig further into PIMCO, and uh, to do that, we need to look at the company itself. First of all, uh, as we noted in that article that PIMCO was acquired by Alliance SE, and, uh, but before we look at Alliance, we're going to look at PIMCO. A PIMCO, or Pacific Investment Management Company, LLC, you can see there an LLC, and if you look over here to the right, the revenue is undisclosed to the public. Uh, the key people are Bill Gross and co-founder Mohammed A. Elarian. I'm sure you're familiar with that name. So the uh, revenues are undisclosed, and uh, this is a fund that was founded in 1971. Gross manages a total return fund, the world's largest mutual fund with assets of $242.7 billion as of June 30, 2011. He co-founded the firm, launching with $12 million of assets. So uh, we started with $12 million. We're now at $242 billion. Previously, PIMCO had functioned as a unit of Pacific Life Insurance Company, managing separate accounts for that insurer's clients. In 2000, PIMCO was awarded, uh, acquired by Alliance SE, a large global financial services company based in Germany, but the firm continues to operate as an autonomous subsidiary of Alliance. PIMCO oversees investments totaling more than $1.7 trillion on behalf of a wide range of clients, including millions of retirement savers, public and private pension plans, educational institutions, central banks, foundations and endowments, among others. So, wow, that's a big statement there. These are all of your paper Ponzi players who are giving their money over to PIMCO to manage it. And now we have PIMCO uh, talking about investing in gold. Of course, it's gold futures they're talking about, not real gold. Now, let's take a look at Alliance because this is actually the company that owns PIMCO. Alliance is a German multinational financial services company headquartered in Munich, Germany. Its core business and focus is insurance. 
as of 2010, it was the world's 12th largest financial services group and 23rd largest company, according to a composite measured by Forbes magazine. Its Alliance Global Investors Division ranks as a top five global active investment manager, having 1.443 trillion euros of assets under management, of which uh, 1.131 billion are third-party assets with specialized asset managers, including PIMCO, Bonds, RCM Equities, Deji Real Estate. Alliance sold Dresner Bank to Commerce Bank in November 2008. As a result of this merger, Alliance gained a 14% controlling stake in the new Commerce Bank group. So uh, you can read the rest of this. I'm going to link this to you. You can see the global reach of Alliance. So here's another player in the gigantic paper Ponzi scheme. You can see the list of the countries involved uh, is long. Uh, the, the entry for the United States says Alliance has a growing prevalence within the United States, notably Alliance Life Insurance Company of North America and Alliance Global Corporate and Specialty and Fireman's Fund. Alliance Life Insurance Company of North America employs close to 2,000 employees. Alliance also owns Pacific Investment Management Company, commonly called PIMCO. Now, you can see in another... Uh, well, actually, it's right here under operations. Alliance has operations in over 70 countries and has around 180,000 employees. So this is a gigantic company. Uh, if you want to look at other companies, uh, some of the largest companies in the world, uh, 180,000 employees, that's going to be one of the biggest companies in the world. So to finish off, let's take a look at the history here of Alliance and some of the controversies here. This is from Wikipedia, and so this is, uh, I guess it would be considered to be Snopes verified since it's here on Wikipedia. In 1993, Henning Schulte Noel commissioned a new archive for corporate history, becoming the first Alliance CEO to address the company's activities during the Third Reich. The archive opened in 1996. In 1997, Schulte Noel asked Gerald D. Feldman, historian from the University of California, Berkeley, if he would undertake a larger research project on Alliance's past involvement with the Third Reich. Feldman started the research in 1998 with a team of young historians. A few months later, Jewish World War II survivors and their descendants took Alliance and other European insurance companies to court, accusing them of unpaid insurance policies. Alliance and four other insurers supported the creation of the International Commission on Holocaust-Era Insurance Claims. Furthermore, Alliance became a founding member of the German Foundation Remembrance, Responsibility, and Future. Both organizations took care of payments for the victims. Feldman published the comprehensive results of his research in the September 2001. Based on these results, Alliance established an ex exhibition in the Archive for Corporate History and on the Internet. The research concluded that Alliance as an organization and through its corporate officers was forced to comply with the Nazi regime and the Third Reich. Starting as early as the 1930s and continuing all the way through the collapse of the Third Reich. Among more notable examples, Alliance managers held senior positions in the administration of National Socialist Germany, Kurt Schmidt, Director General of Alliance until 1933, was Hitler's Reich Economics Minister from June 1933 until January of 1935. He became a member of both the Nazi Party and the SS in 1933, rising to the rank of Brigade de Führer, which is a one-star general in the SS. Edward Hilgard, member of the Board of Alliance, became head of the Reich group for insurance in 1934. He represented the insurance industry in a conference summoned by Hermann Goering after the November pogrom of 1938. Hilgard reported on the material damages caused during the Kristallnacht 
program. That's the Knight of the Broken Glass, and that's an insurance company and broken glass. And the estimated amounts of money insurance companies had to cover. Feldman summarized his findings, stating, quote, it was just one more piece of business in the Third Reich, but it demonstrated that such pieces on any large scale made contact at some point with all that is represented by the name Auschwitz. From slave labor to extermination, virtually inescapable. So there's Alliance, and they are the parent company of PIMCO, and PIMCO has decided that they need to increase their gold holdings. Of course, uh, their gold holdings are going to be gold futures. But uh, even so, just with the mention of buying of some paper assets, and here we go here as we get back to silver, you can see in the overnight session, we've actually penetrated the $30 mark. That's my target mark that uh, if we get through that, we should see an substantial explosion in price and you can see we've actually penetrated that mark after hours so it's looking like we'll see a very exciting day tomorrow and perhaps the rest of the week will be very exciting as uh, we move up through 30 and onwards to the new levels of 32 and ultimately new highs past 50 and we'll talk to you next time